We are a small but hearty group, are we not? We are. Uh, wow. I'm glad you're able to be here. Tell me a little bit quickly about, uh, well, I'm going to tell you first of all about it, the fact that this is a three-part series and that I'm going to be available to any of your organizations uh, at the end of it to consult with you on a, on a short-term basis. Today we're going to do a talk about culture. Culture and fundraising is everything. If you don't have the right culture, the right attitude, the right ideas, um, you're going to fail. Sure as sure uh, shooting. We're going to talk about fundraising stigma, a little bit about mission and margin, and uh, the case for support. In a couple weeks, we're going to do a webinar on November 12th, and I believe they start at 10 o'clock. There's a flyer in your packet, uh, 10 till 11 or 11.15. That's going to be around organizational structure and readiness. How many of you are from coalitions? Almost everybody. OK. That'll help us frame that session to talk about how do you, how do you fund a coalition. It's a real challenging kind of proposition. And I've, I've been there and, and helped with some of that. Uh, we're going to work on case development, on getting that message and that uh, story out more, more importantly. Uh, reliability autonomy index in terms of the funding that you get, how reliable is it, how much autonomy do you have with it, and trust me, the federal grant gives you no autonomy whatsoever. You, you have very, and very little reliability after the fact. Fundraising processes and donor data. And then on December 10th, we're going to talk about more specifically some fundraising methods, talk a, a little bit about donor stewardship, cost benefit, and uh, improving your board and, uh, and key stakeholders, so working on that. All right, so as was mentioned, my um, position, I was on the, the community partnership board for about 10 years in uh, was region four, uh, Chisago, Pine, Canabec, Sandy, that area over there. Uh, I uh, was the fiscal agent for that group for a number of years when I was executive of another group. I also, <coughs> Uh, worked at the Hazelin Foundation before it was Hazelin Betty Ford as their vice president of, of development for a number of years. So I've been in the nonprofit sector. I've been doing fundraising for a long time. I'm, I'm familiar with the issues that you guys are facing in terms of federal grants, you know, ever diminishing and uh, coming to an end. And um, I was on the board at the community partnership when we made some of those transitions from completely federally funded. Uh, to more sustainable funding in a variety of different ways. So I'm hoping some of my examples will be helpful to you folks going forward. Um, let's talk just for a little bit about fundraising as, a, as an overall concept, okay? Because oftentimes when we get into a federal grant, we forget that there's a whole world of other fundraising kinds of things out there. And I always find that as a, a practitioner, it's good to go back and, and wrestle with theory. And the theory of fundraising really for us comes out of our, uh, for many of us, comes out of the Judeo-Christian uh, heritage. But it comes uh, from every basic religious and major societal background as well. The, the word philanthropy comes from the Greek, philine and anthropos, to love man. Uh, a, a, we often think of it as a, a bigger kind of concept, that philanthropists are really magnanimous large donors that give to big, com, big chunks of society. Think, think of some names that come to mind for you. Gates. Gates. Buffett, who else? What else? Think back historically. Rockefellers. Rockefeller. Who built all the libraries? Carnegie. Carnegie, yes. We've got those names that, that gave large sums of money to a big part of the population or to communities as a way of helping mankind, humanity. Then we go down, not down, but to the word charity which comes from the Latin caritas, to love one's fellow. What do we think about when we think about charity? Handing out. Handing out? To those in need. To those in need? 
charity is not as big as philanthropy, is it? Charity is something that's done to a smaller group usually. Uh, you know, you have a charity fund drive, or you used to have, before it was called the United Way, the, the charity fund. Um, so it, it, it's, it means, in, in some sense, the same thing, to love one's fellow people, members of society. But for us in our construct here, we think about philanthropy as big, charity as smaller, and then we think about Velferan from the Middle English, well, welfare, to go well. And what do, we, what do we think about when we hear that term? What do you think about when you hear welfare? Poverty? People in, in need, 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 what else? Supplement. Supplement. So it's kind of that, that base level that we as a society uh, want to support everybody at a, at a somewhat uh, main level or low level of substance. substance. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the concepts of philanthropy, charity, welfare go back to, uh, to many of, the, uh, of us who came out of a Judeo-Christian perspective. Um, the Greek culture, the Quran has uh, significant uh, intent and purpose to give away to each other, to help each other out. The Talmud, the Torah, and then the fire insurance of the 1800s. You've got a quizzical look on your face there, Ed. What else? Anybody think about what the fire insurance of the 1800s was that encouraged giving? The what? Mutual companies you're not talking about. No, not the mutual companies. What was going on in our culture here in America and in Europe, but primarily America, during the 1800s, early 18, middle? What was going on? The only thing I can think of is everything was built of wood and we used kerosene lamps. The Industrial Revolution, okay. right? Wood, lumber. Help me out here, what else? Railroads? Mining? Transportation? Gas and oil? Right? This was part of the industrial growth of this nation in a significant way. Who was making the money? Uh, owners of the companies. Owners of companies. Let's name some of them. Come on. Uh, Hill. Hill. What? Again, Carnegie, and Ford, Rockefeller, Rockefeller yeah. Kennedy. Those big names that we still know today were making a lot of money in those areas, right? And who were they making the money on? Or what were they making the money on besides those natural resources? People. Dollar a day workers, right? Yeah, my, my grandfather worked for the railroad in the early 1900s after this, but he was making about a buck a day or so, maybe a little bit more prior to the, the Depression. What was the prevalent religious entity of the day? Christianity, and particularly what church? The Roman Catholic Church, which suggested quite strongly that if those people who were making money on the backs of the poor did not give some of that back, they were going to roast in the fires of hell. Hence, fire insurance. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's bad. But <laughs> the, the idea, was, and, and that's where many of our philanthropists came from, not only out of that guilt and admonition from the, the clergy and the church, but also out of some magnan magnanimity, that's pronounced correctly, to, to give back. So certainly Carnegie wanted to see knowledge dispersed in every community. And, and many others wanted to see, the Kennedys wanted to see the arts uh, flourish. So 
we see that, but both out of a desire to help humanity, out of a need to keep people healthy, and out of some, sometimes, guilt. I would suggest that sometimes fundraising might feel something like this. <laughs> You've all had, you know, kind of that, or maybe this. <laughs> what do you feel here? What's the emotion that this talks to you or, or gives to you? Help me? There's that plea. What other feelings do you have? I feel sorry for them. Sorrow? So, sorrow? Feel sorry? Notice me. Notice me? Kind of maybe a little bit of guilt that I'm doing better than mm -hmm. they are. Um, that, you know, so there's sorry for them and there's that little bit of tinge of guilt. And um, does this create donations to these feelings? Mm -hmm. Some, some, um, not always though. But if there's one thing that I want you to take away today, and you may see this a couple times, this is, a, this is such a poignant point. Fundraising in the social sector is not begging. Yet there is that attitude among a lot of people that, ah, he's just trying to get in my pockets. That darn fundraiser, they just want to, you know, take my money away. Fundraising in the, in the social sector for things like prevention education, for drug treatment, for healthy kids, for healthy communities, it's not begging. It's asking people to participate with us in supporting those facets of our culture which are of the highest quality, right? Health, well-being, spirituality, religion, arts, education, new ideas. That's what fundraising is about. Not this. Not this. It's asking people to participate with us. How does that idea resonate with you? Awesome. Awesome. Thumbs up. Yes? Yes. Does, if you had that on your bathroom mirror, would it change the way that you went about asking for money? I've never met a donor, and trust me, I've met some very large donors and some very small donors. I've never met a donor who didn't want to, in some way, help to participate. It's a matter of finding the right person at the right time. But uh, very few feel anger at being, at, at making a gift. Okay? So this is something to take away because our culture and the way that we go about thinking about fundraising makes a whole lot of difference about the way we receive it as well. So, Maya, Angelou, you want to compose a good world? It is an honorable and noble profession. I have a lot of people come up to me, <laughs> students of mine in a number of different colleges, universities, and ask about well, what's it like to be a fundraiser? And I have to honestly say it's a lot of fun. It's not hard work. Oh well, yeah, it's work. I mean you've got to you you've got to work at it, you've got to get better like any like any skill, but it's it's awfully a lot of fun when somebody turns to you and says, Reed, I'd like you to come and do in our community what you did over there. And I'd like to give you some money to do that. And it's even more fun when you ask for seventy, eighty thousand dollars and they two weeks later give you a check for a quarter of a million. Or when they invite you into their home and say, you know, you've really done a, a great job. Here's an additional hundred thousand. And that happens. Let's look at a couple years here real quickly of, of contributions. I don't want to spend too much time on this, 
But I want you to think now about something else in, in addition to changing that culture or that attitude of, uh, of fundraising. This is Giving USA's report, and I've got a couple of years here. This goes back to 2012. And the total contributions in 2012 were $316 billion across the US. Where did it come from? Can you guys in the back see the numbers here? Where did it come from? Individuals. Individuals. Interesting, huh? Do you see the federal government on here anywhere? No. Uh, if it was going to come in somewhere, it might come in the area of foundations, but this is really talking about private foundations. And so we've got three quarters of that 316 billion coming from individuals. Who uh, starts foundations? Companies. Companies sometimes. Who else? Communities. Who else? Families. Families. Social organizations. Social organizations. Most private foundations actually were started by individuals or individual families. There are community foundations, there are corporate foundations, but most private foundations have been started by individuals. Uh, okay, so 15 cent percent plus, <coughs> now we're at 97 percent, right? Who makes a bequest? A bequest is a, is a testamentary trust or a, an amount in your will or something that goes to an organization after your death. Who makes a bequest? An individual, okay. Uh, 97 and now we're at, uh, oh I'm sorry, 80, 87 and now we're at 93, 92, 90, 94, thank you. I'm mad. Never a strong suit of mine. <laughs> I always ask the donor to write another zero behind it <laughs> on the check. <clears throat> it. Who makes up corporations? Who owns corporations? Stockholders. Stockholders or in many cases small private corporations or individuals. I can pretty well, and I think we, we generally can trace almost all giving in the US back to individuals. Individuals who give it out of their own pocket at a five dollars a crack or put you know 25 cents in the red kettle to Bill Gates giving away billions right almost all of that giving comes back to individuals now where does it go to this is where it, the recipient organizations of that three hundred and sixteen billion dollars it goes to primarily Religious entities, right? That's Grandma Schmidt putting her five dollars in the offering plate on Saturday night or Sunday morning. That's very large donations going to uh, to help build a new church or a religious edifice. So a third of it comes from or goes to religious entities. Now the interesting thing about this is we don't know how much of that goes back out to other community organizations. We don't know how much of that $100 billion actually stays in the church and how much of it might go to the food shelf or to help house uh, somebody in the community or to provide you know, somebody with needed um, propane assistance to keep them in their house that winter. Uh, but we do know also that the rest of these get a reasonable percentage. Next biggest is education. Everything from the parochial school up to primarily the big universities. Human services, gifts in, in and of themselves to foundations. So individuals potentially giving to their family or another foundation. Health, public society benefit, international arts, culture, environment, unallocated, and then gifts to individuals is about 1%. So where do you think prevention education falls in this schema or ATOD issues. Health, human services. Probably in health and human services. 
Some of it might fall here, but that's a little bit, a little bit more distant uh, potential. Okay. 2013. Look at the percentages. Guess what? Percentage stays the same, even though the giving increased to 335. So almost a 20 billion dollar increase from 12 to 13. The percentages stay roughly the same. Same thing here. Religion drops by 1%, or maybe a half of a percent, and it just a averaged out. Education gained a little bit. Human services grew just a little. So you can see health grew a little bit. Some of these others perhaps uh, decreased. 2014, what are we up to? Wow, yeah. We've seen our way out of the, the recession, right? Because 2012, we were starting to come up. Uh, this is now about even with where it was back a number of years ago. Uh, again, same percentages, except now we've added another $30 billion. Again, same percentages. So who's giving money? People. Individuals. Individuals give, give their money away. They give their resources away, just as they give their time away. One, one little um, tidbit I'll share now, we'll probably talk more about in one of the next webinars. I was doing a seminar and uh, we were talking about individuals who make gifts and one of the people in the, the back of the room said, Reed, what should I do with my volunteer director at the organization where I work um, that won't let us ask our volunteers to make a gift. My, my quick off-the-cuff remark was fire them. <laughs> because people that volunteer with you are probably the closest to you, know you, and are most likely to make a gift. Because people give to the things that they appreciate. Here we go with uh, kind of a, a timeline so you can see Back in uh, 04, 05, and 06, you know, we're now gaining on that a little bit. Um, the, the depression years were here, were recession years, 9, 10, et cetera. After, you notice that nonprofits always fall a little bit behind everything else uh, because the need increases at the same time that donations decrease. So it gets a, to be a challenge. Uh, highlights. Total estimated giving is up, giving by individuals is up, giving by foundations is up, giving by bequest is up, giving by corporations is up. That's good news. That's good news for the whole, whole sector. Um, this gets to Minnesota. These numbers are a little bit older. Uh, the uh, Council on Foundations doesn't do a, a, an annual thing, but you can see here again who gives money, again, it's the same kind of situation, giving by grant makers is much smaller. And here's where the grant making dollars goes. Education, human services, about fifth. Public affairs, arts, etc. Health is another 10%. So about a third of the money that foundations give away is, is granted to health and health and human services. So what do you think are the top reasons why people give? Give me your thoughts. Take a stab. Give back. To give, <coughs> excuse me, to give back. <coughs> because they've been blessed or they have something, so to give back. What else? Something they believe in. Something they believe in. It's an investment because it depends on what they're going towards, but if it's going to help better their community, it's kind of an investment for them. Investment in what they care about? Okay, yes. Let's take it, go ahead. This, tax reasons. Yeah. Tax reasons, all right. Tax writer. These are the reasons that come out of the industry, so to speak. They're not uh, by any chance, or by any stretch of the imagination, um, scientifically based. but. An emotional, personal belief in the mission. An emotional or personal belief in the mission. 
They believe in the stability of the organization. That's interesting. And, and as you think about coalition work, that's an important component to think about. Because a coalition can have feelings of instability, but it can have long history of stability too. So think about that. A sense of civic responsibility that gets to the, to the giving back to my community uh, out of care for the community. And interestingly, a high regard for staff and volunteers. So why do, what are, what are the bottom reasons why people give? They give, but why? Guilt. Guilt. What else? Taxes. Taxes. Feel obligated. There we go. <laughs> You're right. Guilt and obligation. Do people give out of guilt and obligation? Yeah. Yes. What is the size of that gift? What is the likelihood that gift is going to come in time, time, and time again? Small, right? Because you can guilt somebody into, into making a, a gift to your organization, but it is done, the, the gift is given in, in totally the wrong way. Promotional materials. What do <coughs> promotional materials help to do? Educate. Educate. Tell them about what their gift can do. Tell them where it's going to be going. But it won't make a gift. It's not going to create the gift in, in and of itself. And guess what? Do tax considerations enter into a decision on a gift? What part of it? Tax write off. Yeah? The intent to give or the size of the gift? Both. Mostly the size. Mostly the size. The, in, the intent comes first. I want to make a gift to this cause, to this entity. Now, it's a question of how much can I afford? Is it going to be a dollar gift, a thousand dollars, a hundred thousand, or... And in some cases, at, at, at Hazelden, we would have one of our um, d donation staff, our donor staff, development staff, at the office to answer phones up until midnight on December 31st. Mm -hmm. Because on occasion, people would, you know, be spending last minute or, or they decide hey, I want to make a gift and I got to get it in this tax year. And we often uh, would encourage people to give gifts of appreciated stock. Because a gift of appreciated stock can be given for about 30 cents on the dollar. If it's done right. So tax considerations are very important, but they won't, they won't make the gift, they will make the size of the gift or when it will come. People give for a variety of different reasons as well. I want you to take a, a quick look here, and then I'm going to move along and we'll spend more time with this on one of the webinars. But if you think about who in the community, for your community, for um, your coalition, who might be interested and able to make a gift, we call everybody in the public a suspect. Theoretically, anybody living in your community or anybody funding anything like what you do is a suspect to give to you. And we need to identify them and we need to contact them, right? So that's part of the process of engaging them in making a gift. Then we look at what we call annual giving. We want them to make a gift of some kind at some point in their relationship with us. So we're going to provide them information in order to help them understand what that gift can do. And that might be special events, it might be direct mail, it might be social media, any of those ways and we'll spend more time on them uh, later on. We want to then not only inform them but get them interested and involved because once they get interested and involved in what we're doing, they're more likely, again, to help us with all of their resources, not just their time.
But time for many people is easier to give than money. And if you can get them to give time, they may also generate revenue for you later on. Getting them involved, and then ultimately, we want potentially to have them give a planned gift or an estate gift, sometimes called the ultimate gift, where, where people say, this is what I want to leave as my legacy, or I want to help sustain this for the community as a legacy for my family. Say it again, because it's so important. Not begging. No matter how many times you mail, no matter how many times you talk to somebody, no matter how many times you go and, and tell the community that you need support, it's not begging. It's asking people to participate with us. Peter Drucker, some of you may know the name, one of the uh, nations or uh, world's most influential people in the area of, of management, organizational management and nonprofit management. Uh, from the last century, bottom line in the nonprofit world has changed lives. Right? And uh, a, tri a triad author, uh, Let's Ryan and Grossman, wrote a book back a little over 10 years ago where they say, in reality, performance is all about translating caring, believing, and compassion into results. So you folks believe in ATOD education and prevention and intervention, right? You believe in what it can do for the community, for individuals. I believe as a, a former staff person at Hazelden in the power of treatment and addiction prevention. But that's gotta be translated into results, right? And my belief alone, in and of itself, is not going to do that. Nonprofit is only a tax tax. It's not a management technique. And that's a reality that you and your coalitions are going to have to realize as well. Whether you are a fiscal agent of another 501 or are moving toward or becoming your own uh, 501, nonprofit does not mean you're begging, does not mean that you are always looking for another dollar. You've got to work uh, as, in many ways, as a business toward sustainability, toward achieving solid financial goals. Sustainability, though, is more difficult for, than for business because nonprofits have two bottom lines. Nonprofits, coalitions, collaborative entities need to establish and, and complete, fulfill their mission. And as a recipient of a federal grant, you know what those missions are, right? They're articulated in your logic model, they're articulated in your, in your objectives, and you're talking you talk about them in every report that you send out. But you've also got to maintain some financial viability. Because who suffers at the end of the grant? The team, yeah. Your staff, if you've got them, obviously. But who suffers the most? The community, the kids, the, the people who benefit from what you do. And that's a challenge. That's a really high bar to say, oh my gosh, we've, all of a sudden we've got, we go from thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe parts of millions of dollars invested in our community, and we get that for four, five, eight, ten years, and all of a sudden, boom. There's nothing there. So Peter Drucker asks, a couple questions as we start thinking about what are the critical aspects of continuing to raise money after the grant dollars go away. Real simple questions, but in some ways hard to answer. What's our mission? How many of you in the coalition have a coalition mission statement? Good. Good. Most of you do. So you've established that as your coalition's mission, not necessarily the mission of any one of the <coughs> groups that gathers together. Who is your customer? The people you serve. 
Can you articulate that? The community. the community, the public. But I think that's maybe too general. Because you've got to be able to articulate as cleanly as possible who really is buying something from you. So in some cases, the feds are your customer. In some cases, the state is your customer because they're buying something from you. But who in the community, who in the public, can you more cleanly articulate as your customer? What do they value? You know, if it is the public, what does the public value? What does the public want from you as a coalition to see, what do they, what do they want to see happen? They want a reduction in something. They want an increase in something else. They want something, you know, kind of nebulous, or do they want something concrete and solid? Results. You've got to report them, right? And what's our plan? Outside of your grant plan or your work plan for your grant, how many of you have a continuation plan? One, great, you're working on it. So continuation plans have to be about how you're going to continue to find resources to do that. All of you, I suspect, have heard about Jim Collins and the, the work that he's done in business. He says that the, the hedgehog concept for him combines a passion, being best, and what is it that drives your resource engine. So in other words, he's saying these three things have got to come together in order to have a really solid business and, and plan for the future. What are you best in the world at, or at least best in your part of the state at? What can you articulate that you're really good at doing? What are you passionate about? Those two have got to go together. And then what is it that drives your resources? Either volunteer resources, time resources, money resources. How are you going to generate funds? So the question is not how much money do we make, but how can you develop a sustainable resource engine to deliver superior performance relative to the mission? If your mission is about prevention, then what can you do that's going to generate some resources to drive that passion that your coalition has, to drive that prevention engine. Okay? That might be foundation grants. It might be a variety of different ways that you're generating resources and particularly money to do that. How many of you in your coalition work have more than one program or project going on at the same time? A couple of you do. In, in some cases, they're, they're maybe all kind of glumped together, but you could, if you wanted to, you could distinguish them or, or pick them apart, I think. This model will help you to think about all of the different programs or projects you do as they relate to fulfilling your mission or having the capability of driving your resource engine. So somebody give me an idea of one of the projects that you're doing uh, within your grant or outside of your grant. Name it. You aren't doing anything. No. <laughs> sticker shock. What? Sticker, sticker shock. S sticker shock. <laughs> Explain that, please. Um, you uh, have stickers that are created to, um, or it's usually a youth group driven but you have adults guiding them. Um, you have law enforcement involved, but you, the youth contact the liquor stores and ask permission to um, come in with law enforcement and lots of people try to make media with, but you put stickers on the product and it's an awareness campaign to, to try to raise awareness to adults that um, the kids in the community do not want underage drinking to go on. Great, so sticker shock, so an awareness campaign that uh, runs where it involves the, the police, involves the liquor stores, and involves the youth, probably parents, to educate people that are buying alcohol or consuming alcohol about the, the impact it has on kids. Okay? 
If we looked at that in terms of the mission merit and community impact, would that be high or low? <coughs> Well, just think about it, yeah, in, in terms of what you would guess. Would it be a high impact or a low impact in terms of you as a coalition accomplishing your mission? Does it do a lot of good things for your mission? Yeah. yeah. So so I, I would probably... Awareness, prob awareness alone. Awareness alone puts it pretty high. So we would say probably in this area here. Pretty high in terms of helping to accomplish the mission of your coalition. Right, you'd have to look at the data. How is it in terms of financial viability and sustainability? Do you generate any revenue from it? No. None. It costs you money, right? Mm -hmm. So from that sense, it's going to be low. So you're probably going to find that sticker shock in this quadrant up here. Okay? Now, the quadrants would suggest well, let me go back. Does anybody have a program or project that is currently making you some money outside of the grant itself? Anybody? One of the things that Community Partnership did in Chisago County was to develop improv, improv troops. You've heard of them? Youth grown and generated improvisational groups that went out to schools, went out to community gatherings, and they generated both foundation support and some earned revenue from that because they asked organizations to support the, the group coming to them. So that from a perspective of mission merit and community impact would have been where? Pretty high. It involved kids, it involved kids delivering a message, it involved kids delivering a message to the community or to other kids, so high on mission. How about financial viability and sustainability? Pretty good, yeah, pretty good. It was, it was up in here. It didn't make a lot of money, but it did cover both its costs and some administrative uh, and then a little bit beyond that. So it was generating enough revenue based on how it, you know, how it was operating. So from that perspective, it was up here. So what this matrix does is ask you to plot where each of those programs or services or products that you deliver are. And if they're here with high mission impact and high financial sustainability, great, invest in it, build on it. And I know that the partnership started off with one improv troupe, and I think by the time they were done, they had three or four or five going out nationally across the country to, to do both improv and to train other improv groups. And that's where the, the dollars generated was really helpful. So it started off just with one group of kids doing improv. And it, it multiplied up into groups going across the country. Um, the sticker shock is high mission impact, but it has low financial sustainability. So what can you do there? The recommendation is celebrate the success and either manage costs and fundraise or subsidize. So as long as you've got the grant, it's subsidized. But when the grant goes away, how do you think you might be able to fundraise for it? I even talk to liquor stores or owners and ask for donations that they pay for the stickers. Because really that's the only cost is the stickers. So liquor store owners might be willing to pay for the stickers. They might be willing to support. How about uh, the Lions Club or the Elks, one of those large animal groups? You know, buying, <laughs> buying the, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you know, the lines, the moose, the bears, oh my. <laughs> um, buying the stickers for the kids to put up. And maybe buying them at more than just cost. So you have the potential of that kind of thing. Down, whoop, over here you've got low mission impact, high financial sustainability. Can the impact be improved or can you build on it? You know, in some cases, selling t-shirts 
is it part of your mission or not? You know, it's one of those things. Or having a garage sale or a bake sale. You know, it's pretty hard to tie that directly to your mission, but it might bring in revenue. Currently, I'm on the board of a, of a, a nonprofit that does a basic human need. And we've got nine or ten food shelves across about a ten county area. Those food shelves are not in this, right? They're over here. High mission, but they can never support themselves. We also have nine or ten thrift stores. Guess what? They're, you know, they're only partly high on the mission side. Because they, while they provide clothing and you know that kind of thing for people that need to to shop at a thrift store, they're also you know antique, uh, you know people that go antiquing and and that kind of thing, crafters that it's not part of our mission, but they do provide much needed revenue to support the food shelf. If you're down here where it's low mission and low financial, then you need to really assess its value and either improve or drop it because it's taking time and energy away from something else. Ed, would you give me a hundred dollars? If I had it. If, if you had it. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Shelly, would you give me a hundred dollars? No. No. Would you please? What for? What for? Mm -hmm. Well, Ed, on the way here, Coming across 95 from Pine City to St. Cloud, there were two squads, and one of them got me. And you know, I can put in probably 50 bucks or so for the ticket, but I'm going to need 100. Would you help me out? No, no, no. Um, Shelley, even though you said no, I want to tell you what's going on in our neighborhood. Um, the woman across the street in the cul-de-sac from us turns out she just found out that she's got cancer. And it's treatable, and it looks like things are going to be okay in about five or six months down the road. But you know, she was the primary breadwinner. Her husband's been on disability, and they've got three kids all in school. And you know, I happen to know that their their mortgage is kind of iffy. And what we're doing is, my wife and I are going around the community and asking people that are working to chip in hundred dollars toward their mortgage. We're going to, the bank has agreed to set up a fund for them. And since my wife and I are both working, we both put in hundred dollars toward it. And because we really don't want the kids to have to move or the, or the housing situation in our community to, to deteriorate. Oh, Could I call I was gonna say, you? You had me in cancer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Why will you give me hundred dollars? See, it's about the emotional connection. So if there are two things that you take away from today, one, it's not about begging. Two, it's about an emotional connection. All of the data, all of the numbers, all of the logical rationale why ATOD prevention is important in your community, they're great, they're wonderful, all of the tax advantages, but nothing will come to helping a person make a contribution more than a story about what is happening. What's going on? Who's benefited? How have they benefited? So your case. We're going to spend more time on this at the uh, first webinar in November. But your case for support is that written document that says why it is so critically important to support the work that you're doing. And it talks about things like why you need and merit the support. It outlines the programs and current needs and it shares the results. It introduces the issue, talks about the solution, talks about how you're going to know if you're going to be successful, about outcomes, okay? All of those things are important. But the most important thing is to tell a story, emotionally and forcefully. People make a decision about making a gift or giving a gift charitably or philanthropically based on about 80% story and about 10 or 20% logic. 
And in some cases, the size of the gift will be determined on the, on the logical part, on the how big is the impact. But the decision to make a gift is based on primarily the emotion that you share, the story that you share with them. And how will people benefit? People give to, pe to people, not to programs. If I had said we were going to have a program to support uh, people in the community that were having trouble paying their mortgage, right, it would have been, you know, if I had said cancer victims who are having trouble, it might have had more of an impact. But to say the family across the street from us, that's a personal impact. It's a personal relationship. Talk about the kids in your community who are benefiting. The best thing that happened to us in the, at the partnership in uh, North Branch was the story about a kid and her brother, a teenager and her brother, who were incredibly benefited by the work that was, was done and how she told her her story of drinking and drugging and what she'd come to understand after being involved in the um, improv groups. It was, a, it was a very forceful story. Avoid believing that your process is the outcome. You can read these in your, in your packet, but um, don't, don't think about the fact that your activities that you do time and time again are going to be the outcome or the end result. Sticker shock is a process. But how do you know that it's having an impact? How do you, how do you know that it's, it's accomplishing something? That's what you need to, to look at as well. Um, I gotta do a little promotion here. I wrote a book a few years, or a year or so ago, entitled, and we're right on time, five minutes, uh, entitled The Seven Deadly Sayings of Nonprofit Leaders and How to Avoid Them. Uh, this is the link. Limited time coupon of about 15% off is Sayings 7 all lowercase. Charity Channel Books also has a whole variety of relatively inexpensive and solidly written books by practitioners about fundraising, about managing nonprofits, about working in coalitions. There are just a few of them. Uh, help they want me to fundraise, major gift fundraising, fundraising for the genius, uh, practical advice and tips from the professional community. I am happy to provide to you an hour-long uh, individual phone, email, reading, reacting to anything that you want to do. It's available for uh, people that attend all three seminars uh, so that you're, you've got the basics of what you need to do to continue funding and after those seminars then in January or February I'll be happy to sit down with you on the phone individually, look at any material that you'd like me to look at, uh, and give you some thoughts or, or hints. So take advantage of that, uh, and that is my contact information as well. Questions? We've got about three minutes. Anybody? Does it matter who is doing the asking for like individual gifts and foundations? <coughs> yes, it does. Question is, does it matter who's doing the asking? Best person to ask somebody for a gift is a peer. So if, if I'm a um, teenager going to the CEO of a major company in town, I'm likely to get you know, a $25 contribution. If I'm the CEO of another organization in the community, I'm going to go in and know how much to ask for and the fact that I've made a substantial sizable gift is going to have a significant impact. So yes, it does. But it helps to have uh, someone who can uh, provide testimony to what is happening. So to have a CEO and a teenager who's benefited go in to talk to the CEO <laughs> is an even better situation. Now, to have a group of eight teenagers go, no. <laughs> OK. Does that answer your question? Yes. The, who, who writes the grants? Who uh, signs the grants? All of those are, are important. Go ahead. We do a campaign letter each year. OK. And 
the executive director always signs it. But it sounds then like it would probably be better having a board member who is higher in the community. I, if you're doing a, a, a letter, <laughs> fundraising letter to the community from the coalition, I would make sure that all the coalition member names are on the letter. I would have the board chair and the executive director sign it. Uh, if you have the ability to segment your uh, list to business owners and to, you know, different entities, <coughs> then you might have different letters sent to different people. And we'll talk about some of that in the, in the webinars coming up as well. I just have a quick question. Is there someone that there's a list of just grants that are available? Um, sure. Uh, not, not a list, but the Minnesota Council on, of Nonprofits and the Minnesota Council on Foundations both have booklets or sites where you can go and uh, type in my issue is ATOD uh, from southern Minnesota and they will give you a list of foundations or, or corporations who do support that kind of thing. Okay. Who, who, who are the two people? Uh, Minnesota Council on Foundations has it available I believe on their website in a searchable database. Okay. Minnesota uh, Council of Nonprofits prints a booklet every year. As a matter of fact, I think they might be doing their presentation in the next month. It generally comes up in November. So check out M Minnesota Council of Nonprofits.org. MNCN.org. Of, um, of Nonprofits. Yeah. MNCN.org. Am I right too that there's the gambling? service your area, it will say by county uh, who, who does your area and you can ask for funds. I believe that is true. Yes, I am not, I am less familiar with the, the charitable gambling stuff, but they are required to, uh, they have to, give to contribute so back. Last question or two, there's an evaluation form, please uh, give it to our capable and able student in the blue. And I thank you for participating. You've been great. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to be online with you.